This morning's sermon is based on a text depicting another moment in the lost week of Jesus' earthly life. Listen now to Matthew's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 34th verse. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question in order to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In order to fully appreciate what is happening here, I think we need to put this little vignette in some proper context. Verse 34, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, gives us some clue. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, of course, absolutely hated each other. Now, some have described them as being the liberals and the conservatives of their day, although which group we call conservatives and which we might call liberal would depend on how we view the politico-religious milieu of the first century. But the point remains, the two principal power groups have aligned themselves in intentional opposition to each other. One group, the Pharisees, has just discovered that Jesus bested the other group, that is, the Sadducees, in a religious debate of the Sadducees' own making. The authors of Matthew's Gospel record this earlier in chapter 22, specifically beginning at verse 23. The Sadducees tell the story of a woman who has gone through seven husbands, all brothers, who died in succession. They ask, whose wife in the resurrection will she then be? And Jesus, of course, manages to disarm them with his answer. We can well imagine the Pharisees delighted by this. Who among us, on some level, does not like to see our enemies or our opponents made to look foolish? It seems, much as history would remind us over and over again, there is absolutely nothing like an enemy to unite a group of people. Often the strongest, most long-lasting friendships are formed in the heat of battle when confronting an enemy. As well, by the way, the longest-lasting and most irrational hatreds are often forged when we confront our enemies. Just a quick story to illustrate my point. Not that long ago, I was playing the organ for a church service. Now, while I'm a composer of what some would describe as modern art music, I tend to favor music of the Baroque era and even earlier in much of my performance. So I was playing a choral prelude, most likely by Books to Huda, if I remember correctly. Because translations can sometimes be terribly awkward, I asked the parish secretary to simply leave the title of the prelude in German. I didn't think anything of it until a few days later, when I was told that the church had received more than one upset telephone call from parishioners expressing their disapproval. Not so much of the music, but of the German title. The most colorful complaint of several similar complaints was related to me something like this. The man called and said, We fought and beat those, expletive deleted, in the Great War. I don't want to have to look at their, expletive deleted, language when I go to church to worship my God. I suppose that might be amusing, if it were not terribly sad. The colorful complaint was levied by a World War II veteran, and he was, of course, referring to something that took place 70-some-odd years ago. Common enemies, 
even long after they have ceased to be enemies, it seems, still inspire the greatest anger and perhaps the strongest of human ties. Now, we might also imagine the Pharisees using this opportunity to show up the Sadducees and discredit Jesus at the same time. For the Pharisees were now all the more convinced of their intellectual and spiritual authority and superiority. So they attempt to trap Jesus, or at the very least test him, as our text reads, by asking him what they believe to be a trick question. What is the greatest commandment? And that, in their minds at least, is one of those questions that has no good answer ranking right up there with, Mom, who is your favorite child? And, Honey, does this dress make me look fat? Nearly any way Jesus answered the question, they imagined he would be in an irresolvable theological muddle. Even saying they were all equally important might be an inadequate answer. Some might argue that the commandments that deal with one's relationship to human beings can't possibly be as important as those that deal with our relationship to God. But then again, the first commandment with a promise attached to it is in fact, honor your father and your mother, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now we know the answer that Jesus gave. Mark's version of the story, found in the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel, has a scribe asking Jesus this question, and the scribe, by the way, approving of Jesus' answer, and even briefly expounding on it, which in turn earns the scribe, it seems, praise from Jesus. You are not far from the kingdom of God. So it seems that it is possible the Pharisees approved of the way Jesus began to answer their question. And the beginning of the answer it could not have been all that unexpected. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Certainly that is something the Pharisees in Hebrew, the parashim, literally those who separate themselves, could readily approve of. It seems that the better part of what they did was to put into action their love for their God. Their strict adherence to the letter of the law their opposition to both Rome and the current religious leadership, based on its lack of purity and appropriate anointing, were all ostensibly related to their love of God. What they probably were not expecting was the second part of Jesus' answer. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The fact that Jesus elevates this second part to being as important as the first and then equates them both as the summation of the entirety of the law and the utterances of the prophets made it that much more perplexing and perhaps ultimately enraging. And here I must interject that if we, in our time, are not made at least a little bit uneasy by this, we're probably not understanding the true import. Look at what is more or less a parallel story in Luke's Gospel, maybe somewhat helpful. Luke's version of the story, if it is indeed even a version of the same occurrence, recorded in the 10th chapter of Luke, has what is described as an expert of the law quizzing Jesus on what he must do to inherit eternal life. When Jesus tells the expert that he himself already knows the law and asks him just what does it say, it is the expert who comes up with a saying that we think of as the first and greatest commandments, which points to another fact that may make us a little uncomfortable. The truth is, this saying probably did not originate with Jesus. A contemporary of Jesus, a rabbi named Hillel, is famously quoted as making a similar attestation in answer to another trick question, though he formulates his answer in the negative. Hillel says, That which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. 
That is the whole of the Torah, or the law. The rest is commentary. Go and study it. So we see these theological ideas already present in the first century. Now the expert from Luke's Gospel then asks Jesus, in order to justify himself, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with a so-called parable of the Good Samaritan. So a Samaritan, a foreigner, is my neighbor? Indeed. In equating the two great commandments in his answer, as recorded in Matthew, Jesus is effectively saying you can't have one without the other. To love God is to love neighbor. To love neighbor is to love God. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor. But then again, it is an awfully big neighborhood. The Parashim, the, the Pharisees, in their arrogance, came to Jesus looking to discredit, at the very least, the hated Sadducees. And Jesus effectively tells them that you are not really loving God until you love your opponents as well. And that is the part that in this polarized world, conservative against liberal, poor against rich, Muslim against Christian, against Jew, against atheist, the words of Jesus rang out clearly. Love your neighbor as yourself. Elsewhere, the master instructs, love your enemy. Do good to those who hurt you. Pray for your enemies. All exceedingly simple commandments that are not so simply carried out. Now, I could go on giving examples and theology to back all of this up. And by the way, the dialogue in our text is not nearly complete. It goes on for another six verses. Jesus asks a question to the Pharisees about whom they consider the Son of Man, the Messiah, to be. And at first, that was going to be the primary thrust of this message. But somehow, the Spirit seemed to stop me here suggesting that this simple text will essentially preach itself. So to conclude, I'm going to do something I, I seldom do. I am going to ask all of you within the reach of this sermon video to do something in light of what we have just been discussing. And by the way, it is a spiritual exercise I have been attempting for some time. Far from perfectly, but by God's grace, at least mostly consistently. I would like for you to pick a neighbor you're not all that fond of. Now that could be a literal neighbor, the annoying fellow who lives up the street, the busybody in the apartment next door. Or it could be a world neighbor, someone or some group you consider an enemy. If you are a conservative, it could be your least favorite liberal politician. If you are a liberal, pick your most detested conservative. Tonight, or better yet, right now, pray for that person. No, I don't mean like Tevia from Fiddler on the Roof. God bless and keep the czar. Yes, keep him far from me. I mean, really pray for that person. If nothing else, Recognize that he or she or they are also God's children, made in God's image. Now let me see if I can be as offensive as Jesus often was. If an American or a Canadian pray for the members of ISIS. Yes, I did just say that. And, and no, I am not suggesting you agree with what they do. In fact, God forbid you should agree with violence as a solution at all. But pray for the people. Pray even for the leaders, remembering that St. Paul was Saul, the approver of murders before he met Jesus. Moses was a hot-headed killer before God called him. And Christ died for each of us while we were yet his enemies. 
yes, it is a challenge. Can you do it? Pick a person or a group tonight, and then another tomorrow, and another the day after that. Try it for a week. Now, if you think you're not so good at prayer, then perhaps just try saying something nice about this unlovable neighbor. Or better yet, try saying something nice to them. Indeed, this is a serious challenge to you and to me. And I make that challenge in the name of the one who is light and love. I challenge all of us who bear his name to carry out the first and second inseparable great commandments. Yeah.